right, so glad everyone is here. We are uh, ready for a great evening of worship and a great evening of just listening to what God has to say to us so that we know how to walk it out. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get started. Dear Gracious Father, we just want to lift you high right now and, and glorify your name and thank you for who you are and what you are doing in each of our lives, Father God. And we, we want to be active in getting to know you. We want to get be active in proclaiming who you are. And so right now I just pray that everyone in this room will just quiet their soul, ready to receive you, ready to listen to you, Father God, that you may be magnified and that we will be able to be strengthened with confidence so that we can walk out of here today ready to shine light and life into other people, Father. You've called us to be disciples. Equip us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, let's stand to our feet as we worship our Lord. Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing with name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory.
Father, we just praise you for this time of worship. God, we lift up Mikaela as she comes to speak from your word. God, we invite your Holy Spirit to just take over this place, to continue moving in hearts. God, our desire is that we would not be conformed to this world, but we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds with your truth. So, God, we ask that you would do that tonight. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Um, my name is Mikaelin Sweet, and I am the assistant minister to youth and university um, here at the church. And so that means that I get to work a lot with both Seth and Allison, and I absolutely love what I get to do and the relationships that I get to build with the college students and the youth. Um, but something that makes our staff dynamic a little unique is that I am also Seth's cousin. And so we find that our extended family and my immediate family are in Weatherford a lot. And it's awesome. We love it. Um, but a few years ago, on this particular Saturday, uh, they had come to watch me play a soccer game, and then we were going to eat some lunch, and then we were going to go watch Brayden play football. Well, Brayden was my then boyfriend, now husband. And so... And it's my mom, my mom, and I all in the kitchen together. And so there's a few things that you kind of need to know about my mom, my mom, and I. And so the first thing is that we are one and the same. I think just like my mom, and I have the same manner mannerisms as my mom. And D Dog has a few pictures. Um, that's all of us up there. And the second thing you need to know is that I grew up watching my mom cook all the time, my mom and my Mimo. My mom cooked every night for us during the week. She's a phenomenal cook. And Mimo was in the restaurant business for like decades before she retired. The woman is a wizard in the kitchen. She's just so good. And so one of my favorite things to do on my days off is to go spend it with Mimo and go cook with her. And so that's what some of those pictures are. But on this particular Saturday, as we're making lunch, there's one thing left to do before we can eat, and that is um, cook the toast. And so I turn on the broiler, I put the toast on the sheet pan, I put it in the oven, and I shut the door. And because there were no gasps or concerns from this group, this might be a little bit of a cooking lesson, because you never shut the door when you turn on the broiler of an oven. Um, so it went bad real fast. All of a sudden we see smoke coming through the burners, I freak out. I'm kind of like, what's going on? I open the door, and it's just straight flames. And I, like, all of the bread is on fire. And I'm like, what do we do? And they both look at me, and they go, I don't know. I was like, there is 120 years of life between the two of you guys. How do you not know what to do? So me, the 19-year-old who has never cooked for myself, I just do what anybody does. You grab water, right? So I start filling up this pitcher. And I'm about to dump this pitcher into the oven because what else am I going to do? They're not saying anything. And so I get to the point where I'm about to throw it into the oven. And Mima looks at me and she goes, turn it off. And I was like, what? And she goes, cut the source. Just turn off the oven. And I was like, well, that sounds a little bit better than throwing water. So I turn it off and the flames immediately go down. And all we're left with is... 12 pieces of toast that look like this. Yeah, <laughs> totally inedible. And what we're doing is we're just dying on the floor laughing together. Um, but it's, that kind of thing would happen when we all get together. And so it wasn't a shock at all that we would be the ones to burn the house down. But the reality that we live in and why I share this story is that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life and life to the full. That's John 10.10. 10. And we can't just ignore the fact that we have evil in our lives and it's on fire in the oven. We can't just slam the door and walk away and hope that it goes away. And we also can't go grab a pitcher of water thinking that we know what's best and put the flames out ourselves. We have to go to the source. 
And we have to go to the source that gives us life, and that is Jesus. And so that is what I'm talking about tonight, is how to overcome evil. But before I get there, I kind of want us to dive into, like, what is evil? So my very first point is identify what evil is. And evil is usually thought of as that which is morally wrong or bad, sinful or wicked. The word evil can mean anything that causes harm with or without moral dimensions. And so there's three ways that we can see evil played out in our lives. The first being because of you. So you commit the act yourself. There's nobody else to blame because only you can control your thoughts, your actions, your words. Then the second reason is because of others. And this can be a little bit of like a cause and effect. And so you may not have done the evil thing, but you may be doing life with somebody or in a relationship with somebody that committed the evil act. And so now you are suffering for it. And the best example of this is if you've ever been on a sports team, usually you guys are all held to the same standard. So when somebody doesn't meet that standard, everybody has to run for their mistake. It's kind of the same concept. And then the third reason is because of a special purpose in order to bring hope or help to others. And so sometimes there's just absolutely no explanation for the evil that we're walking through. We don't pray for cancer. We don't pray for accidents. We don't pray for natural disasters. Whatever that is, fill in the blank. But somehow we find ourselves in it because we live in a broken world. And so the thing about us is we have such a finite knowledge that we can't see how this could possibly be used to make something beautiful. But that's why we serve a God of infinite knowledge where he can look at the whole picture and he can make something beautiful out of ashes. And he can take the story, turn it around, and make something good of it where you could share it or you could touch another life so that the kingdom could grow. And so if that is how we can see evil in our lives, then how can we know what evil is and what it isn't? And evil is anything that contradicts the holy nature of God. And when God created the earth and mankind, it was good because it was a reflection of God himself. And the fall of man was the moment when evil entered into a good world and it tainted and separated humanity from God because we are no longer holy enough to be in his presence on our own. He is the only one without evil. So while God was not the author of moral evil, it is his holiness that defines it. And fast forward a few thousand years past the fall, we find ourselves choosing our own desires, choosing sin over the Lord, and often um, dealing with evil at multiple points in our life. And so in the same way that we experience evil, there are also consequences for evil. There's personal consequences, communal consequences, and sometimes without reason, but never without hope. And so with this understanding of what evil is and how we see it in our lives, we're going to apply this um, to a story in the Bible. So if you will open up to Luke 8, 26 through 39, um, we're going to read, I will read for us. And if you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along on the screen. Verse 26 says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. 
For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would not break the bonds and be driven by the de- er, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus asked him, "What is your name?" And he said, "Legion." For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all of the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, so he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. And so now I want us to identify the evil in this man's life. And so the first thing that we see is it describes him with the name Legion. And Legion was was not a proper name, but it was actually the designation designation of a Roman military unit that consisted of about 6,000 soldiers. So through this name, we can see that there is more than one demon in this man. And one is one more than I ever want in my spirit. Uh, Just saying. Um, The second thing we see is that we see he has no regard for personal dignity because he's walking around naked. We see that there's social isolation, that he's retreating to an unclean shelter. It said that he lived amongst the tombs. And whenever we think of tombs, we think of a graveyard, and he might be like living under this tree next to this tombstone. Well, that's not how it worked um, at this time. Uh, Tombs, there was actually a place of burial. So it was found in the side of a hill or in a cave. So that's why this man could seek shelter there, is he's living in a cave um, or in the side of a hill amongst decaying bodies. And the last thing we see is there's a control of speech, shouting, and great strength when they tried to shackle him with chains. And we don't know what got this man to this point in his life. We don't have context for that. We don't know if it was his actions, if it was somebody else's actions, if somehow he just woke up and he had demons possessing him. But clearly, this man was under the control of spiritual powers, totally opposed to Jesus and God's will. And if the demons are the epitome of evil in this story, I don't want us to glance over their interaction with Jesus. And so Jesus stopping at the town was a very abrupt visit. I'm going to kind of tangent here for a second. And I'm going to say that any time we are living in sin, it's going to be an abrupt visit from Jesus. Because if we weren't living in sin, we would be worshiping him. And if we're worshiping him and we're in relation with him, we would know where his presence was. And so that's another indicator that Um, they're full of evil. And so up until this point in his ministry, until this encounter with the demon, demons, um, Jesus had been in predominantly Jewish areas. But Gerasenes was a Gentile region. And so Gentiles are pagans who don't believe in a one true God or who don't know the one true God. 
Jews are so prided in their religion um, that they were looking for the one true king. So even in a location where people didn't know Jesus, when he came face to face with a demon-possessed man, the demons immediately knew who they were talking to because of their response. And their response was, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high king? And I want to show us three things in this response. The first is that there's an understanding of who Jesus is. The demons give an appropriate, a textbook, Sunday school answer, if you will, of who Jesus is because they say, Jesus, the son of the most high God, which isn't wrong. So clearly there's some head knowledge, but there might not be some heart knowledge. We also see that there is an understanding of Jesus' purpose because they immediately knew what it meant to be in his presence and for them it meant judgment because they said, I beg you, do not torment me. And I'm, when I'm encountering somebody for the first time, I'm not going to walk up to them and say, I know who you are. Like, I beg you, do not torment me unless I know what that person is there four. And so the last thing we see is that there's an understanding of the punishment for evil. Because they say, do not send me into a place where I will be punished um, and suffer forever, the abyss. They didn't want to face Jesus because it would allow them to remain in the man in whom they've established their home. This shows us that evil cannot exist by itself, but it only needs an inch in our lives to go a mile. And Earl has a saying about sin um, that I think is very applicable, and it embodies this all so well. Um, He says it often, but it's, sin takes us further than we want to go, it keeps us longer than we want to stay, and it costs us more than we're willing to to pay. And that's because evil thinks it knows better. It's always short-sighted. It thrives in instant gratification, and it mirrors our selfishness. And so the reality for us is we may not look how I just described the man possessed by a demon. He may have some very extreme qualities about him. But we can identify with him because there are evil in our lives. We just have to be honest with ourselves and name what evil we are struggling with and what evil is in our lives. And the reason we have to do this is because Romans 12, 9 says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And we cannot hold fast to what is good. We cannot love Jesus genuinely. We cannot love his people genuinely if we are also in evil. They don't mix. And so all of our sin is significant. All of the evil in your life is significant. All evil is worth repenting and confessing from, because that is how good, how significant, how life-changing, how transformative, how joyful a life in relationship with Jesus is. That nothing is worth keeping us from a relationship with him. And so that leads me to my second point. There has to be clear repentance in your life. And at the end of this text, we see two reactions to Jesus casting out the demons. The first one we see is in verse 35, and it describes the man as sitting at the feet of Jesus, dressed and in his right mind. This is completely opposite to how we were first introduced to this man a few verses verses back. We know he is not only changed by his actions, but also that his heart had changed. Because repentance means to turn away. 
And the evil in this man's life had been confronted. It had been casted out into a herd of pigs, ran into the pond, and drowned forever. And so now that this man is saved from his evil, he's left with a response. Will he acknowledge Jesus, the one who saved him, or will he try to figure out what to do on his own and completely ignore the encounter that just happened? But we see here that the Greek word for healed in verse 6 is sozo. And that means to be made well. It means to be saved. And so that suggests that the man became a believer and a disciple of Jesus. He displayed true repentance, turning away from what God had prohibited, turning to what he had commanded of him. And repentance leads to transformation. And I absolutely love that it's noted that he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, just completely content in who he is, hanging on every word that he says, because that is a person that he declared belief in. And he's going to the source to learn what it looks like, and he's not ashamed of his past, because this is who he has declared belief in, and he's so confident in the life that he is now living, his new life. And that is my hope and prayer for us tonight, is that we can get to a place where Jesus is enough. That sitting in his presence is all we need. Um, that we have a hunger to follow him. That we are begging him to take us with him, to use us, um, to be on mission for him, to continue to share the gospel. And something I want you to know is everybody in this room has access to the feet of Jesus. We all have the ability, despite our past, to declare that we have belief in who Jesus is. The Son of God, who came and lived a perfect life, that then died on a cross for the evil and the sin in your life, to then be raised again so that we can be in relationship with him. In a life following him, is better than any sin or evil that can make a home in our heart. But it's not lost on me that that's not the only response in the text. The townspeople also saw what was happening, and it stirred something inside of them. And that's the truth of living a gospel-centered life, of repenting and confessing and truly owning what you did is it causes other people to talk about your transformation and it causes them to evaluate their own heart. But unfortunately, when the man's actions brought the townspeople face to face with Jesus, they knew who he was, but they were so comfortable in their pagan lifestyle that what they were, they were so comfortable in their lifestyle and what they were doing that they just wanted Jesus gone. Just out of sight, out of mind, they found themselves saying that whatever Jesus had to offer was too uncomfortable, it was too powerful, and it was too overwhelming for them to believe themselves. So they did what they could do to get him gone. And so where do you find yourself right now? Are you at the feet of Jesus doing everything you can to know him more? Or are you doing everything in your power to get him out of your life. Both are active decisions. So who are you in the story? And that leads me to my final point of keep going back to the feet of Jesus. And we see this example um, in Peter's life, a disciple of the Lord. Peter was a faithful follower of Jesus. He loved him, he did life with him, he learned from him, yet when the time came to finally own his relationship as Jesus is being on trial and taken to the cross, 
Peter finds himself denying Jesus three times. And the reality that he did that just absolutely broke him. And he sat in that shame and in that guilt. But I want us to look just real quick at John 21. I'll read just a few verses, 15 through 18, at this interaction that Peter actually gets to have with Jesus post-resurrection. And so John 21, verse 15 says, They had finished breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him for the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And so you can see that there was clear repentance in Peter's life as he's getting to declare his love for Jesus to him, but I want us to notice where he is in verse 15. Um, He's sitting in the Lord's presence over a meal. And Peter could sit in the grace of Jesus' presence only if he remembered who Jesus was in all the moments of life that happened together that validated Jesus' character. And so what that means for us is there's an element of remembrance in this point in overcoming evil because we are prone to wonder even back to sin as followers of Jesus. We've seen this in Peter's life, and I'm sure you can think of examples in your life. And so as I was preparing for this topic, and I'm thinking about, okay, how do we overcome evil? This song um, popped into my head from Chris Renzima. And I would argue that Chris Renzima is the best lyricist in the Christian genre, hands down. Um, I've been an avid listener since high school when his music came out. And I love his songs because there's such a depth to his lyrics. He brings Old Testament scripture to life. And he describes a relationship with Jesus in such a beautiful way. And so it's hard to listen to him and not find yourself also worshiping the Lord with him. In this particular song called Just As Good um, with Ellie Holcomb, he has a bridge that says, And I will build an altar and stack it stone by stone, because every Ebenezer says I've never been alone. My faith will surely falter, but I don't change what you've done. Because every Ebenezer points to where my help comes from. And this is how we keep going back to the feet of Jesus. We build an altar made out of stones. An altar was often built to commemorate an encounter with God that had a profound impact upon someone. It usually meant that that person's desire was to give himself fully to the Lord. So an altar is a place you build to go and sit at Jesus' feet. And like the lyric said, the altar is built out of Ebenezer's, and Ebenezer means helping stone. And this is found in 1 Samuel 7, when the Israelites built an altar to the Lord with these stones because they had just experienced victory in battle only because of the Lord's doing. So Samuel raises a stone and he said, anytime you look at this, remember what God has done. Remember what he did today and remember what he will continue to do if you surrender to him. So this rock became a symbol for them of God's character and who he was, who he is, and who he will continue to be. 
That's why they continued to look at it. And so at my high school, the football program um, had a saying, and it was on all of their shirts for a few years. It was brick by brick. And this is the same concept as Rome wasn't built in a day. So we were a brand new high school with brand new athletic programs. And it's common knowledge that powerhouses aren't built overnight. And so it's years and years of culture and excellence that get you there. But because we, my class, was the first graduating class to go all four years in the high school, the likelihood that we're going to see the results of our hard work was minimal. But each day we came in and we bought into culture and we created a tradition and we played with excellence, we were laying the foundation for a powerhouse to be built in years to come. And when you profess belief in God, that decision is your first stone in your altar. Jesus was faithful to deliver you from sin and make a way for you to have a relationship with him. The longer you follow him, the more you get to know him, the more stones you are going to be able to put in your altar to remind you of who he, who he has been and who he will be. So when we wonder again, and then there's clear repentance in our life, you have a place to go and to sit at his feet. And you have moments that you can look back on to remind you of how good the God you serve is. For me, one of my Ebenezer's is this church. And there's a little nursery rhyme that we used to do when we were little, and I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it says, here's a church, there's a steeple. Open the doors, and there's the people. And that has, that has been, um, that couldn't be more true for my life than the last six years that I've been here. And so in my living room, I keep this picture. And it's a picture of this church, which you're like, why? You are here right now. We're all here. You work here. Why would I have a picture of the church at my house? But it's a reminder for me, when I look at this, of the freshman girl who walked in six years ago, who was eight hours away from home, who was trying to figure out what college looked like, who was trying to figure out how to love a teen. I was trying to figure out what Christian community looked like, what it meant to stand on my own two feet, what it meant to live out my values in my beliefs. And every single time I came through that door, Jesus met me where I am and helped me take a step to where I am today. It's pretty powerful. Um, <laughs> but this place is where I found community. And this place is where I got married, and I'm sure if you told that freshman girl who had never had a boyfriend that she'd be married in four years, she'd flip out on you. Um, this is a place that I have stepped into ministry, and this is a place that I have committed my life to serve the Lord no matter what it looks like. Tonight, that looks like me coming on stage and sharing with you guys. And this is the place where the people I love the most are. And they push me to be a better wife, a better friend, a better sister, a better follower of Jesus, and a better disciple maker. And when I look at that picture, it's one snapshot in a 14-year relationship with the Lord. And as I think about what he has done through this church and through his people, I'm reminded of who he is and who he will continue to be no matter what evil I encounter, no matter what the next season looks like, I can trust him and I can follow him because he is better. And so I want you guys 
to journal your Ebenezer moments with the Lord sometime. Create an altar and go and sit at Jesus' feet because he is enough. And so Brennan and Sarah are going to come up and they are going to sing the song just as good. And as they sing the song, I want you guys to know you have permission to respond however you would like. If you need to sit there and you need to journal your Ebenezer moments with the Lord, do that. If you need to stand and worship, do that. If you need to confess and repent of the evil that you are carrying into today, do that. Don't wait. Don't take that home with you. You have access to Jesus' feet. If you need to profess belief in Jesus, tonight's the night. Heaven is too late to do that. If you need to talk to somebody, come pull one of the staff members aside, come pull your friend aside, and let's get real and let's get honest because no evil is worth holding us back from a relationship with the Lord. So let me pray. Dear Father, thank you so much um, for being a father who provides God, who shows up, Lord, who is present and active in our lives. Lord, thank you for being good. Thank you for defeating evil. Thank you for making a way for us to be holy again, to be in relationship with you. I pray that all of the hearts in this room um, surrender to you, God. That's not too big of an ask. That they know you as the son who came to save them, Lord. And so I just pray over what's about to happen next and the decisions um, that are going to be made, God. And I pray that they would choose to follow you and not sh shut the door to the fire that is burning inside of them, God. So come, Lord, let your spirit come and awaken us tonight. In your name I pray, amen. as good as when I met you. You are still just as kind. Don't let me forget that you're still the same God who led me through the fire. You're still the same God who separates the waters. Come do what only Through the fire, you're still the 
Kylan, great job. Wonderful job. Uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, is it Little Smokies over in there? Yeah. Uh, if anyone uh, needs to talk to a staff member or anyone uh, needs to, you know, come, come find us. We would love to talk with you. But uh, you are dismissed. Have a great evening.